In today's video, we're going to talk about Ultramarine Blue, comparing it with other brands, and talking about its characteristics. Hello everyone, long time no see. If you're new, welcome to my channel and I'm Elisa. Today we are going to focus on Ultramarine Blue. I have it in several different brands and we are going to dive deeper into this pigment. Even though there are some temperature differences between French Ultramarine and Ultramarine Blue, it is usually a warm blue and sits towards violet on the color wheel. It is a strong sedimentary pigment and it mixes well with other colors to make rich, strong darks, subtle grays, and mauves. Ultramarine is a non-staining, transparent pigment. Let's go check it out. I'm gonna leave a link to all these paints in the description below. Today we're going to discuss our Ultramarine Blues. We have brands Grumbacher, Van Gogh, M. Graham, Windsor & Newton, Daniel Smith & Sennelier, and Mission Gold hasn't come in yet, and I will put that in there when I receive it. Starting with our Grumbacher, uh, this one I've actually done in another video, and it really looks very vibrant when you put it down and it's still wet, but as it dries, I noticed it gets this chalky film over the top of it, and I really don't care for that final look for my paintings. Next, I'm swatching Van Gogh's Ultramarine Deep. Now, I have a few different ones here. I have Ultramarine, Ultramarine Deep, and French Ultramarine. Uh, the differences between these varieties can be very subtle. Uh, French Ultramarine is slightly warmer and redder, and it has more granulating attributes, whereas Ultramarine Blue is generally cooler with less granulation. And even though they have these subtle differences, they are all made from the pigment PB29, with the exception of Sennelier's French Ultramarine, which also has PB15. They all have a light fastness of one. The only one that didn't have that written on the tube, though, was Van Gogh's. Here I am swatching M. Graham's Ultramarine Blue. While I'm continuing to swatch these different Ultramarines, I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit more about the actual pigment Ultramarine, a little bit about its history. The name Ultramarine actually means beyond the sea because it was imported from Asia. This mineral was mined in Afghanistan by Italian traders during the 14th and 15th centuries and then imported to Europe. Ultramarine is a deep blue pigment and it's originally made by grinding lapis lazuli, I'm probably saying that wrong, into a powder. While studying more about ultramarine, I found out that the natural ultramarine is the most difficult pigment to grind by hand, creating a pale grayish blue powder, with the exception of the highest quality of mineral. At the beginning of the 13th century, an improved method came to use. This was a process of mixing the ground material with melted wax, resin, and oils. Then you would wrap that mass in a cloth and then you would knead it in a diluted lye solution. And the blue particles at the bottom of the pot, while well, the impurities and colorless crystals remained inside the cloth. This process was performed at least three times. I'm gonna stop here for a minute as I'm beginning to swatch my mixed colors. I'm actually gonna go into my CAD yellow light with my ultramarines creating a green and I'm going to try and create pretty much the same green all across the board. 
just to give a really good comparison between all of the colors. I can push those colors more yellow green or more blue green depending on how much pigment of each I add to it. So I'm really trying to stay in a neutral zone here of a really even blue to yellow ratio. I really want to see the differences in the mixes between cad red cad yellow light and alizarin crimson as well as mixing blacks so we're going to get to all of those in this video sometimes i do have to go back and forth between the blues and the yellows or the blue and reds just to make sure that i'm getting the same color across the board sometimes you you get it a little bit too light so you got to go back in your blue and that's okay you're never going to get it necessarily 100% correct the first time. So that's why it's important to just take little bits of the paint at a time as especially with blue and red, they're so pigmented and so strong that just a little bit of paint can really push it over the top and go completely opposite of what you were aiming for, like going more red when you wanted more blue or more yellow if you wanted it more green. I love the granulation that I'm getting in Danielle Smith's French Ultramarine. I don't really have that other than this tube, so I'm definitely going to be adding that to my list of ones to keep because this one has more granulation where Sonolia does not. So it's nice to have both of those in my palette. So you can see here Sonolia and M. Graham are both non-granulating which is good to know because not everybody wants granulation in their paintings, whereas Grumbacher and Van Gogh have a little bit of granulation in them. Sennelier's paints are formulated with increased honey content for enhanced luminosity and brilliance. Honey also acts as a preservative to extend the longevity of the paint itself. So I really, really have loved having Sonolier paints. For most of my colors, there are a few that I prefer, Danielle Smith, and I think I'll have both of these on my palette from now on. Moving on to our mixtures with red, I want to be very careful when I'm mixing these. Both my red and my blue can be very potent. So I want to make sure that I'm just taking a little bit of paint at a time to really get these violets correct. Color mixing can take time to master, which is why it's important for us to do these color swatching and even color mixing within swatching our colors. It allows us to understand our paints better to get the color theory and why this color and this color will create a new color and, and how we can do that. So when we go into our paintings, we are not as confused and we can just pull those colors and understand them and their relationship to each other. And also how they react with other pigments because of the minerals that are in them. Some of them repel, some grow great together. You can see some of them because of their granulation, you're gonna see little bits of those other colors you're mixing in with them. So this is all very important to know. And you can use this to your advantage when painting, understanding the granulation, the transparency, the staining quality of your pigments. All of these things are incredibly important to learn as a beginner watercolorist. Because of the granulation that is in the Daniel Smith paints, you can actually see some of the red and yellow that is in the mixes that we've created. It seems to be a characteristic of Daniel Smith's French Ultramarine. Now let's do this again, but with our alizarin crimson. Again, we want to be very careful as we're mixing these as our blue is fairly strong in comparison to alizarin crimson. And we want to create an even violet tone. As I was doing the swatches for these, I noticed that 
the violet from these was a lot more bright and brilliant, where the ones from Arcad Red Light were a little more dull and neutral in color. Okay, now we're gonna get to our blacks, and I'm gonna show you the difference between mixing your Cad Red Light with your Ultramarine Blue, which creates a lovely black, and then if you add your yellow, it will make it feel almost dead. It'll neutralize it. When going in to make my blacks, I wanna have a lot of pigment and very little water. I really want to make sure I have an even mix and you'll be able to see that intensity of this black. It's a lovely color. Now, I'm gonna add a little bit of yellow and you're gonna see how it neutralizes that really quickly. And there's not a lot of yellow. Do you see that? How it very grayed that down, it dulled it down. It went from this beautiful black to this gray. So ultimately, this is more of a very deep violet that I'm using as my black. This one's actually more purple than it normally goes for me, but that could just be this brand. This really works for me and gives life to my blacks or my darks. But I use Sinalia usually. Now we are going to neutralize it with our yellow, not a lot. And you see how it pulled the temperature right out of there and neutralized it to a gray. That's what we're looking for. My M gram feels a little bit more blue for this black in comparison to the other two. Those ones still feel very purple or violet to me as far as this black goes. They're still very deep and great for blacks or really dark darks, but it feels more blue and one more violet. And put our color look. How beautiful of a gray that is. Now I did something similar to this, only I used our, our browns and our blues to create some lovely grays. This is another way we can get some of our grays. I really like this one. It really made a beautiful gray right there. Many of you might already know this uh, if you watch any of my videos, but ultramarine blue is probably one of my most favorite colors to paint with. I always find myself reaching for it, even though I love so many other blues, I just kind of feel gravitated to this specific color. Moving back to the history of it, Ultramarine was the most expensive and finest blues used by Renaissance painters. It was valued chiefly on account of its brilliance of tone, its inherentness in opposition to sunlight, oil, and slacked lime. European artists used the pigment sparingly, reserving the highest quality blues for the robes of the Virgin Mary and the Christ Child. It remained an extremely expensive pigment until a synthetic one was created in 1826. See, this gray is actually quite interesting because it has some reds in it. Like if I were to touch it with water here, it, the granulation, you're seeing those reds and those blues and the yellows all pop out of there. So this one would be quite interesting to use for certain things because that granulation really pulls those colors out of there. Now we'll move on to our snowy. If you see a little bit of reflecting in our Sonolian Van Gogh, that's partly due to the fact that the, the binder was um, kind of settled as it was shipped to me, and I forgot to shake them up real good. So there was a little bit more in there. So you, when I put it on pretty thick at the top, you can still see a little bit of sizing in there. And same with the Windsor Newton. Um, Make sure when you get them, especially if you're in higher elevations, to try and shake that up a little bit more and mix that up so that that sizing 
you know, goes through the entire tube and doesn't settle. I don't think I ever fully go black with any of my paintings. I get very dark using this method and I do have some grays like Payne's Gray, Neutral Tint, and some others by Joseph Zabuvic and Alvaro Castagne, but I don't actually own a black and I like this way of painting for myself and for my paintings. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with black. You can use it. I've even seen people add blues or reds to kind of give it more warmth or coolness, and that's just fine. I'm going to pick this up and let you guys get a closer look. You can see the chalkiness that I get from Grumbacher and the beautiful granulation that we get from Danielle Smith. I want to allow you guys to get a little bit of a closer look so you can see the smoothness and the granulations in each of the colors. And I will post a high resolution picture of this on my website linked below. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit more about ultramarine blue. What other colors would you be interested in learning more about? Let me know in the comments below. And if you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe. It really helps me out. And don't forget to click on the bell so you can be notified when I upload new videos and content. And I'll see you in the next one.